So good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining. I'll go ahead and get started. Okay, so the agenda for today is first we'll look at the background and motivation for PCB reliability analysis. Then we'll look at some PCB modeling basics, you know, how things are taken care of under the hood in the solvers. And then we'll discuss our PCB reliability workflow and go through an example reliability study where we use that same workflow with a, the Galileo board in a hypothetical situation inside a, an autonomous vehicle. And we'll wrap up with some conclusions, takeaways, and show a demo and some Q&A. All right, so what is driving electronic reliability? What are the key performance indicators? So we have uh, the need to increase number of new features for products. We want to lower costs in general, maintain engineering headcount. You don't, you don't want your uh, overhead to go through the roof. Uh, accelerate time to market, of course. You want to improve the first pass yield and decrease warranty rates. So across the board, it doesn't matter what technology trend you're looking at, whether it's 5G, electrification, autonomous vehicles, IoT, PCB reliability is really at the backbone of all of these trends. So it's, it's really important to make sure that you understand what kind of risk you have with your PCB when you put a new product out there. So what solves or helps mitigate electronic reliability? Uh, well, some of our answer solutions, of course, right? So we have EMI, EMC simulation for antenna design. We can do signal and power integrity verification, optimize power layout and thermal management, and really put that all together in a multi-physics simulation where we have high-performance computing tools and design exploration to study a wide range of parameters in your design space and eliminate failure mode. So basically, try to simulate what's, what's going on with the, with the product in real world conditions so that you identify where it might fail and are able to mitigate that risk beforehand. Now the traditional design process is shown here. So you would design something, build it, test, find any issues and fix whatever breaks, right? So then you go, you keep on going, repeating, build, test, fix, build, test, fix. That is very time consuming and, and very expensive as well. Um, by some estimates, 73% uh, of product development costs are, are spent on that cycle of test, fail, fix, repeat. So that's uh, basically just going through the lab, finding some issue that didn't work. It, it could be mechanical, it could be thermal, it could be anything and then fix it, redesign, rebuild, rebreak, until finally you have uh, a working product. So that, of course, we know takes a lot of time and is, and is very expensive. But if we look at doing this through simulation, so what does an electronics design simulation workflow look like? So on the left, we're starting with Sherlock. So here we're doing pre-processing and taking advantage of, of the Sherlock part library that has over a million unique parts uh, and lots of material properties already built into it. So that's going to feed data into thermal and mechanical simulations. If we look at thermal, we're, we're talking about flow fields and temperatures, and this is being solved with uh, ice pack. And if we look at uh, electrical, we're, we're talking about power and signal integrity, and this can be solved with two tools, either HFSS 3D layout or SI Wave. They're, they're kind of used interchangeably here. And actually, the DCIR solver, the part that's important for the heat losses going over to ice pack, is pretty much the exact same solver. So it doesn't matter which tool you're using. We're still going to get the dual heating losses from either 3D layout or SI Wave and send those over to ice pack. And there's a loop here because those uh, losses are temperature dependent. So ice pack gives the temperature back to the electrical tool. And then either 3 layout or SI wave is gonna recompute those losses with the new temperatures, send them back to ice pack, and you loop two or three times until you get converged power maps and temperature fields. So once that's in place, you wanna to go to mechanical and do shock and vibe analysis. 
importing those final temperatures that you got from ice pack and taking advantage of the pre-processing that Sherlock gives you by creating a working model with geometry, material properties, mesh settings, boundary conditions, uh, all that good stuff, basically have that pre-processed model ready to go where you can apply any custom conditions if need be. And then finally do a, a lifetime prediction reliability analysis, putting all of those results together inside Sherlock. So what are our EMI solutions for electronics reliability, uh, HFSS and SI wave? So here we're looking at signal integrity, far field radiation, PCB and component hotspots. When you link those tools to ice pack, you're gonna get the temperature and you can do that two-way loop. And also uh, shielding effectiveness. So that EMI design aware flow, bring that pointer up, is dealing with signal and power integrity and electromagnetic interference. And the business's impact here is, is pretty big. It's at least six figures if you're able to cut down one cycle of design in the PCB. So that by itself has, has a ton of value there. Now, when we go over to DCIR and thermal, where we're using ice pack and HFSS, 3 layout or SI wave, we're looking at power and thermal integrity. So things like DC voltage, current density, then mapping those heat losses over to ice pack, where you're gonna get package and PCB temperatures. And then finally find any kind of uh, electromigration issues where things are getting too hot and you have too high current density that basically that, that little segment of copper might evaporate, right? Um, and this system aware design flow, so we're, we have power and thermal integrity and we call it system aware because we're actually taking into account how the system behaves at, at the thermal level, right? So uh, in the system, we have the fans, the heat sinks, the chassis, uh, the environment, basically. How does that affect the temperatures of your board and package? And then how do those temperatures affect the electrical performance? Okay, on the structural side for electronics reliability, of course, we're looking at mechanical. So for this uh, structurally aware design flow, you wanna look at things like a drop test, workbench, vibration studies, any kind of manufacturing processes. And at the end of the day, you wanna use, um, you wanna apply some sort of load cyclings and get lifetime reliabilities once you go back to Sherlock. So of course here, you wanna prevent recalls. You wanna make sure that, that the product works at the mechanical level and, and really is gonna, um, has an acceptable probability of failure or an acceptable level of risk for the use conditions throughout the lifetime of that product. And this brings us to the reliability physics solution that we have with Sherlock. So this is electronics focused, uh, RPA, reliability Phys physics analysis tool. And it helps you predict product failure early in the design process, quickly and accurately. So here we're looking at uh, mitigating any kind of thermal, mechanical, and manufacturing risk. And as I mentioned before, a big value that Sherlock adds is being able to pre-process CAD to FEA uh, a lot faster than if you're doing it just manually by yourself. So it can take an existing ECAD model and spit out a working mechanical model in a matter of minutes instead of doing all of those steps manually and taking hours or days to build up a complex model. So in some sense, it democratizes the FEA capabilities. You don't have to always go to your mechanical guru to do these type of analyses. More people can do them and identify any kind of issues early in the design process. So the whole idea here is looking at thermal cycle fatigue, predicting any kind of solder reflow uh, failures, shock and random vibe, and then finally putting it all together and saying, okay, for that PCB, what is the associated risk with each component of cycling? So vibration fatigue, uh, thermal cycling, uh, plated through hole, uh, thermal cycling, and then putting it all together into an overall combined risk for the PCB. 
So at a given point in the lifetime, whether it's one year or five years and 10 years, what's the probability of failure given all of those conditions there? And maybe I'll just go back one second here. Um, just hear that if you contrast these S curves with a constant failure rate uh, actuarial database. So of course that's never gonna include any kind of real physics and you're never really gonna be able to capture the true reliability if you just go by a standard database there. Okay, so let's look at some PCB modeling basics. So we say ECAD a lot, um, and what does that really mean? So it's just electrical CAD data, so anything you get from an EDA tool. Uh, what does it have? So it has a stack up, which is a combination of, of materials, uh, dielectrics and metals. The dielectric is typically FR4, metal is typically copper. And they alternate uh, between each other. Inside each uh, layer, you have traces and planes and vias that interconnect different layers together. So the recommended file types, if you're going into any one of our products, doesn't matter if it's mechanical or ice pack or, or Sherlock, if you're coming from Altium or Zucan, the best file type there is gonna be EDB. So that's our internal ANSYS ECAD database. So they have plugins that can export to the EDB format. And if you're not coming from those tools, the uh, generic neutral format tools, uh, sorry, formats, IPC 2581 and ODB++, those, those work perfectly well. And they can come into any of our tools um, as long as they follow those two uh, standard formats. Now for the actual uh, simulation, so if we, if we think about, okay, so we have the traces. Now, how do we get some meaningful numbers for those traces or how do we actually model that? So it, loosely speaking, there are three approaches. One is the lumped board properties approach. So you would assign orthotropic properties for the in-plane in normal directions. So you think of thermal conductivity would have the same KX, K, KY, and then a different KZ, and assign that uniformly throughout the entire board. So that is going to be very easy to mesh, very easy to solve, but it's not gonna be very accurate, not at the board level. If you have you know, a system level set up, tons of boards or a big assembly, and you don't really care about the accuracy at the board level, then maybe you get away with the lumped approach. But if you really want to get uh, sign off accuracy for uh, package temperatures or PCB temperatures, then, then you really have to do something else. So option number two is explicit trace geometry. So that means taking all of that detail in the ECAD, the traces, the planes, the vias, and modeling everything as solids. All right, so that's gonna be very accurate. It's gonna be the gold standard, but it's gonna be very, very, very difficult to mesh and solve. So it's gonna be a very time consuming process in terms of prepping the geometry, getting a meaningful mesh and getting a good solution. So that is possible for simple boards and packages, but once you look at something like, you know, 20, 30 layer metal boards, I mean, even less than that, it, it's, it gets very difficult to get any kind of uh, good um, geometry meshed and, and get it solved in a reasonable time frame. So then the, the third approach here is with trace mapping. So here we are finding the metal fraction in each layer from that ECAD data. So by, by importing that ECAD file, ODB++, IPC, or the EDB, importing those formats, we know what the geometry is inside each layer. And we have a way of computing what equ equivalent properties are everywhere and then mapping those properties back to the mesh that you're solving on. And we have studies that show that this process, this trace mapping approach is just as accurate within 1%, sometimes even within half a percent of discrepancy compared to the explicit trace approach. And it solves orders of magnitude faster. I mean, just the setup time by itself 
the trace mapping approach is literally just import, set some, uh, some standard best practice settings for your uh, mesh, and that's it, you're done. It's, it's not gonna, you don't need that much more input other than that. With the explicit approach, of course, you have to mesh it and prep the geometry, and that, that can take you know, days or weeks, depending on, on what you're looking at. So in terms of speed and accuracy, you really do get the best of both worlds by doing the ECAT approach. And this trace mapping is similar in both ice pack and mechanical. So just to highlight what's going on under the hood, so let's say we zoom in to an imported PCB and we have all of these black lines, which are the CFD or FEA mesh, and we have a bunch of dots here. So the red dots are gonna be places where we have copper, pure copper, and the blue dots are gonna be places where we have pure FR4. So we have a single cell where we're actually solving and we have a four by four array, so 16 uh, data points that we use to compute equivalent properties. So for the case of thermal conductivity, in the Z direction, that's just area weighted, but in the X or Y directions, you do have to take into account the directionality to get the true estimate of uh, the conductivity in the X or Y directions. So if we look at an example here, here's the, the model we'll be showing uh, down the road, this Galileo PCB. So here's the top metal layer, KX, KY, KZ. And if you compare in some areas, they're definitely not the same. They, they look the same if you just very quickly look at them. But uh, once you dig deep, so here the KX is very low, whereas it's very high for this, uh, the same area, KY. And KZ is always the highest. So that's gonna be the highest everywhere. That's the um, theoretical limit at any location because it's just area weighted. Uh, KX and KY, however, have to take that directionality in plane into account. And then in the dielectric layers, it's a whole other uh, story in terms of, of you know, what's important. It's really just KZ, and that's all that matters. Um, and huge variations across the board, right? So you want to have a unique orthotropic conductivity map for every layer if you really want to capture those thermal pathways accurately. And all of this is taken care of under the hood. Uh, you don't have to do anything special other than import that ECAD. Okay, so let's take a look at our PCB reliability workflow. So at the pre-processing stage, we're starting with Sherlock and SpaceClaim. And Sherlock, of course, is gonna import an ECAT file, ODB or IPC, and then SpaceClaim is where you're gonna put all of that geometry together if you have some additional chassis or heat sink or anything else that you need to add at the system level. And then for electrical and thermal, we have ice pack, so we're doing CFD thermal here, and 3D layout where we're computing the DCIR losses. So because we have current flowing inside that PCB, it's gonna generate some dual heating and we wanna capture that in a temperature dependent way, uh, looping back and forth between these tools. And then with mechanical, we import those temperatures from ice pack, so that induces some thermal stresses. And we do shock and vibe studies and then put it all together into a reliability quantification. So if we break down each process with the different inputs, so with Sherlock, we import ECAD and we can export step, so that goes to space claim where we can put the assembly together with the chassis and heat sinks, anything else that needs to be inside the geometry and clean that up. And that's gonna to go to ice pack. We're doing CFD thermal. As I mentioned before, loop back, back and forth between 3D layout and ice pack to get that converged power map and temperature field. And here, though the PCB temperatures can be sent back to Sherlock to do solder fatigue analysis. So we're just sending the surface temperatures of the PCB to start looking at reliability with Sherlock. So this is early on in the design stage. And then 
Once we have those converged results from ice pack, we're happy with the thermal design. We can go to mechanical and import that, those temperatures. Now they're body temperatures, so it's, it's a volumetric import, and compute the thermal stresses in mechanical and add those as a preload to shock and vibe studies that we're doing in mechanical. And then go back to Sherlock uh, with the strains and displacements that are computed from mechanical and do reliability physics post-processing. So now we're actually computing based on those final temperature fields and, and final shock and vibe inputs, what is the reliability of the board in Sherlock? And we'll go step by step with, uh, with the example coming up. Okay, so here we have an autonomous vehicle, and we're gonna use all of these tools together to mitigate risk of failure. So Sherlock, 3D layout, ice pack, and mechanical. And we're assuming the PCB is inside an aluminum chassis uh, within a larger housing, it can be on top of the car as shown here on the left, or it can be inside somewhere, it doesn't really matter. We're just applying some boundary conditions around it. We're assuming uh, 20C, and it's a very small board. So it, we're, whatever housing it's in is gonna be much, much bigger than that. The vehicle is assumed to be operational for 15 hours every day. And the reliability goal is less than 5% failure rate over a period of two years. So in these snapshots, we're showing Waymo and Mercedes and none of these inputs have anything to do with them. We, we just uh, put all of these together with open source material and stuff that we created. So the PCB by itself is from uh, Galileo, uh, sorry, from Intel, so it's the Galileo PCB. And we're proposing two cooling solutions, so forced and natural convection. Initially, we would hope that natural convection works. If not, we'll have to add some fans. And if we do add fans, we'll have three, uh, three fans located here, each of which can output a max of three CFNs. Now we're not adding any heat pipes or heat sink standoffs inside the chassis. So that, that would be, of course, a, a more detailed and uh, I would say relevant design if uh, we're looking at strictly natural convection, right? So for, for this study, we said, okay, we're gonna keep the chassis exactly the same for both cases. But in reality, you would add uh, some additional uh, heat sinking for natural convection compared to forced convection. So the ambient temperature is 20 centigrade, and the total power on that board without the DCIR losses is six watts. So that's shown over here with the big package there really being uh, about 50% there with the total power, three watts, and some smaller packages around it. Now, wherever we do have the power applied, we're modeling the leads explicitly. So Inside ice pack, we have those leads with the packages meshed and solved as they are shown here, and in mechanical as well. We're, we're using that same geometry to go over the mechanical uh, to basically compute uh, the deformations and also, of course, import those final temperatures from ice pack. Now, in terms of shock, we are assuming three potholes per hour which might be an underestimation, <laughs> depending on what, what part of the country you're in. If, you're in. if you live close to downtown Austin, that's probably not enough. Uh, in other places, that might be uh, too much overkill. But that's the, that's the input that we're using here. So here are some, just um, basically for any, uh, any folks that aren't too familiar with, with thermal, uh, so natural convection, we have the gravity pointing down, and then of course, the plume is gonna go up and rise. Uh, so it's expected to get a lot hotter on the inside compared to force convection where we have those fans, and then the main exhaust is gonna be on the other side. So natural convection is, can be desirable because it's, there's less noise, of course, no moving parts, and fan failures could reduce the overall reliability if any one of those uh, or all three of them happen to fail. So another goal of the study here is to compare the reliability results with and without DCIR. So what does uh, adding those uh, losses add? Does it add any value in terms of reliability? That, that's the big question here. 
uh, many times the, the PCB losses are not as much compared to the power uh, dissipated in the components, but we want to see for this case if it moves the needle in terms of reliability. So just to summarize the scope of this example, we have two cases, natural and forced convection, and each one of those we're going to look at with and without the DCI or losses from 3D layout. So we have a total of four different models, and uh, we're, we want to analyze reliability for all of those. Okay, so starting here with Sherlock, doing the pre-processing and getting horse geometry into space claim, uh, clean geometry finally with the chassis and heat sink and everything going over to ice pack, and an initial working model over to mechanical. So it's important to highlight that, that it, that is an actual working model that goes over to mechanical, not just, uh, not just a step file. Okay, so in Sherlock, you import your ECAD. You can see the, the layout of every layer. You can make sure the, the leads, components are matching up exactly where they need to be. And it has some part filtering options, so you can get rid of anything that's smaller than a certain uh, size. And you can set mesh type of settings, um, what kind of lead modeling you want. So for those critical components, we actually put in there that we want to model those leads explicitly. And it's going to create the material properties, the mesh settings, the contacts, um, and all of these different um, options for the part filtering and lead modeling, all of that's going to go over to mechanical and give you a working model. So here inside Workbench, we have a, this project schematic, and this part here, this the material properties, the mechanical model, and the geometry, all of that is, is what you would get initially. But now that we're doing a little bit of a more complex analysis, because we're adding the ice pack temperatures, so we have this external data import. So this is a part that's kind of like a custom uh, item. But the rest of it here, that's a working model, and that, that can be run as is if nothing else was going to be added here. But here we do want to add the uh, external data imported from ice pack, so we're comparing the DCIR with and without DCIR, uh, what those temperature fields, uh, how they affect the mechanical study. All right, so now we go over to ice pack and we're going to loop back and forth between ice pack and three layout to get converged uh, temperatures and losses. So just to highlight what the how the temperature dependence looks like, if we assume that the entire board is at 20 centigrade and we zoom in on this PWR layer, then we get about half a watt of total DCIR loss dissipation. If we set that same board at 100 degrees, then that goes up to 0.67. Now, if we look layer by layer and compare at 20 degrees and just call that our baseline, uh, the total power inside the board is 1.2 watts. If we say at 50 degrees centigrade, it goes up by 11%. At 100 degrees, it goes up by 32%. So we see that as the temperature starts increasing and get closer, to pushing the limit for that product, these losses can become really important and, and you would expect that they have an impact uh, thermally and um, eventually with reliability. Okay, so here we're comparing the uh, temperature fields on the board with and without the DCR losses. So on the left, we do not import those losses from 3D layout and the maximum temperature is 49. Now, when we do import them, we get about a four degree bump with a max temp goes up to 53. And if you normalize that delta T, so delta T max over the delta T ambient at that part, at that location, um, it's about 14%. So here, you know, that's maybe nothing to sneeze at, but T max of 53 is, is still not pushing the limit in any way, shape, or form, right? 53 is just, okay, that's fine. That's not going to fail. But when we go to natural convection, 
where we are much closer to the limit. So Tmax without those DCR losses is almost 92 degrees there. And with the losses, it bumps up a lot, almost uh, 13 degrees, so close to 105. And that delta T normalized goes up to 18%. And you can see here, just right off the bat, there, there's a big difference, not only in, in the magnitude of the hotspot, but just how much heat is, is spread and located in other locations that, that weren't really um, getting as hot at, before when, when we did not import those losses. Okay, and just for completeness, we, here are the uh, chassis temperatures. So for forced convection and natural convection, it's an aluminum chassis and we are modeling all of those holes in detail. Um, not necessarily uh, something that you would always wanna do, but just, just for fun here uh, to add that level of detail. Um, many times what folks would do would just be to apply a grill object to simplify that and have a pressure drop just based on the free area ratio. But here the, uh, the T-Max is at 23 for forced convection and almost double that for natural convection. And we see the hot spot, of course, changes quite a bit uh, with forced convection where all the air is leaving on this side. So that primary airflow exhaust, that's where uh, you get your you know, the hottest air blowing out. Uh, and in natural convection, it, it's on the top. That's where the plume is going up and the hot air is rising. And we see here what it's... Um, I would say not a great design thermally, right? Because the, the, all those fins are <laughs> not really, uh, you don't have a hot spot at the fin. So that, that's, that's a big concern right off the bat. Um, so in reality, you would want some sort of uh, heat pipe or standoff or some additional heat sinking inside the, um, the PCV that actually drew that heat up into the chassis and took more, uh, better advantage of those fins there. But just for, you know, for the sake of doing this example, we kept the chassis the same for both forced convection and natural convection. Okay, so now we have some temperatures and we wanna send those PCV temperatures over to Sherlock to do a solder fatigue analysis. But before that, we wanna first look at a durating analysis to see if any components are exceeding their, their max temperature. So we already saw that natural convection with and without DCIR losses, there was a pretty big difference there. So looking at the, um, the amount of failures, you know, at 105, a ton more components start to fail and exceed their allowable max temp. And that's just, you know, you have more increased CFD fidelity. So, uh, you know, your, your temperature here in this case is gonna go up with those additional losses. And we have to take that into account somehow. So the initial design had X5R caps, which are rated to 85 degrees. And we said, okay, what if we replace those with X7R, which are now rated to 105? So sure, the Tmax is almost 105 but as it is. So you have a tiny, tiny margin of error. So it's highly likely that either force cooling or, or some other additional heat sink is gonna be necessary. But let's just see what the reliability looks like uh, with this design as is in natural convection. So first we'll do the solder fatigue analysis. And here basically the, the fatigue is, is happening because we're cycling that board on and off every day, you know, because it's off at night and then it turns on at some point. Um, so it wraps up until it achieves its steady state temperature. If we have the natural convection design, it's gonna use those temperatures. If we have a forced convection, it's gonna use these temperatures. And once it's done for the day, it cycles off and then goes back down to that uniform 20C. So that's gonna introduce a lot of uh, solder fatigue with the heating and cooling. And one of the inputs here is the ramp time. So uh, if you wanted the exact number for the ramp time, you could just run a transient an ice pack and figure out you know, quickly how, how, that, how long it's gonna take to, um, to reach steady state. In this case, it, it, we were so far above the meaningful time it takes to, to influence solder fatigue reliability that a hand calc was really enough. So a lump capacitance hand calc says it takes about 22 minutes to achieve steady state here. And, and really the wrap times tend to be more critical 
uh, as far as shoulder fatigue goes when they're under five minutes. So we didn't really run the transient, but if somebody wanted to, you could always do that. That's probably gonna be the more rigorous way of doing it to know exactly how long it takes to reach that steady state condition. Okay, so here we have natural convection with and without DCIR. So without DCIR, all the components pass. Everything is green, and we only have one component that's kind of marginal. And if you look at the reliability curve, the one that's green here, it barely passes the reliability goal, 5% failure rate at two years. So we're about you know, four and change, maybe that's 4.5. So it's pretty close, but it passes. Now, when we include those DCR losses, of course, we're getting better temperature results, and they go up, and now we're not meeting that reliability goal. So we have a failure in terms of reliability, and we have additional components that are very borderline. So that, that moved the reliability needle there just by virtue of adding those DCR losses from three layout. Now, when we go over to force convection, everything passes. It doesn't matter if you do DCR or no DCR, everything passes. So here, the obvious question is, well, okay, you don't have any thermal issues, but are you over-designing? I mean, this is literally the line. It's completely flat. <laughs> so I, even at four years, you're getting, you know, almost um, zero. And actually, this is wrong because the reliability goal is all the way up there. You see the legend here is, is 1%. <laughs> Let me see that I changed that. No. Yeah, so th this line should not even be here. This line is all the way up there. Um, so here, it's pretty obvious that it's completely over-designed. And uh, probably don't need three fans. Maybe you just need one fan. Or, as I was hinting to before, uh, this, this result here is, is pretty close to passing as is. So in reality, a small change in the chassis and the way heat sink is, uh, the heat sinks are connected to the chassis, uh, you could probably get that red line um, even lower than that green line with a few small changes and stick to natural convection as your, as your solution. But okay, let's say we did want to stick with, uh, with forest convection and keep those fans there. Uh, just to compare with and without DCMR, you see that there are uh, differences in the cycles of failure. So without those losses, we get about 35,000 cycles of failure uh, with the, the big BGA at the center of the board. And with the losses, it goes up to 25,000. Sorry, it goes down to 25,000. So 10,000 cycles less to fail when we include those additional losses. So of course, here again, it's, it's over-designed, so it doesn't really matter. But we, just to highlight that there is actually an impact of including those losses here. Now, an interesting question that you could do at this point is, what would happen if the fans were only working half of the time? So let's say that over a two-year lifetime, the fans failed at one year, or over a four-year lifetime, the fans failed at two years. So if all of those fans happen to fail at the same time, so that means that for 50% of the time, you have forced convection. The other 50% of the time, you have natural convection. With the results that we already have here, we don't, we don't need to do anything else. We already have those results. We just have a different input to the solar fatigue model. And uh, we can test very quickly here in Sherlock what, how, what that fan failure would do uh, to reliability. So again, this is similar to the uh, natural convection case. So without DCIR, all components pass. Everything is green. Uh, when we do add DCIR, we, Nothing fails, but we do get a, a borderline case here with the large BGA. So it still passes a reliability goal, but it's, it's a little bit closer to failing here. Okay, so now that we're done with the shoulder fatigue reliability, now we can go over to uh, mechanical and look at thermal stresses. And, and finally wrap it up with shock and vibe. Okay, so in mechanical, we're importing those temperatures from ice pack, and we're doing that via that external data import. 
So we see those ice pack temperatures here on the bottom, and they are mapped very, very well uh, here on top in mechanical. Uh, you really have to zoom in and, and be very picky. You can find areas where, because of the different meshes that they use, you can find 0 0.1, 0 0.2 degrees centigrade difference. But for the most part, these are uh, almost identical numbers in both meshes here. Now that um, thermal field is going to cause some deformation. And again, uh, in the same spirit as we were doing before, just comparing with, with and without DCIR. So we see that with those additional losses, we get more deformation. Um, not a huge difference, but you can tell there's a little bit more red in some areas and a little more yellow compared to without those additional losses. And now that we have those temperatures imported, we apply that as a preload in mechanical, and that goes to the shock simulation. So we want to simulate those potholes three times per hour while the vehicle is driving. So it's a 25G, 10 millisecond halcyon load. And here we have the peak shock strain. So this is using the force convection temperatures as a preload. And uh, also, of course, importing those DCR losses, which we know is going to be more accurate. So in this case, the PCB is small. It's very thick and stiff. And maybe somebody that had a lot of experience with these types of models could just look at it and say, oh, that's never going to be any issue um, just by the aspect ratio alone or the size. Um, but what happens when the board is bigger? What happens when the temperatures are hotter? What happens when those shock loads are more intense? You really don't know unless you do some analysis and, um, and actually go to a tool like Sherlock where you can uh, quantify the true reliability. Okay, so let's look at the conclusions and takeaways. So what kind of design flows can we have with and without reliability simulations? So on the left, we have without doing any reliability simulations, just the standard build, break, fix type of routine. So let's say you design and test. You have uh, the U2A5 failing, thermal cycling, and then you underfill it. So you're adding cost there already. Right off the bat, you're adding some cost to your design. Then you test a new design, and you find something else that fails. So you underfill that. And, you, and again, you're just adding cost, but not necessarily adding value. Then you test a new design until you say, OK, I'm going to add more heat sinks, or I'm going to add some fans, until finally you pass, and you're done. So throughout the process, you added a lot of cost, but you didn't really gain a lot of insight to why things were failing. Now, over here on the right, with extensive reliability simulation, so let's say you have design and you simulate natural convection, and you find that some components need to be replaced because their max temperature is, is being exceeded. Then you do solar fatigue simulation. You find that some components are at risk, so you could either add additional heat sinking, as I was mentioning before, or you can add some fans. Uh, then you simulate that model. So let's say you simulate force convection. You have your final thermal design. It passes everywhere with acceptable reliability. You go to mechanical. You simulate your, your shock. And that passes reliability. And then you go to actually building and testing. And if all is well at that point, you pass. So the big difference between the one on the left and the process on the right is that on the left, we're adding, we're, you know, we're taking a lot of time building and testing and breaking and adding cost, but not necessarily value. Whereas on the right, you're gaining deep, deep insights to how the product is behaving given certain load conditions, how those load conditions affect your reliability, and where you need to improve it to get a testing uh, product that passes those tests. All right, so the key takeaways for um, we're here for the PCB reliability are, so we did multi-physics simulation of a PCB. We know that DCIR is going to verify power integrity and provide those losses for thermal. The thermal simulation is going to help you identify hotspots and provide those temperatures for DCIR, mechanical, and reliability. Uh, mechanical is going to determine the deformations, strains, and displacements due to shock and vibe. 
and then Sherlock puts it all together and gives you an overall PCB lifetime reliability. So doing multi-physics simulations, you get higher fidelity and that helps you improve product insight and of course your electrical, thermal and mechanical reliability.